We welcome you to worship today, and as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day, where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. It has been a month since we gathered at the manger of the Christ child, yet still his star, the star of the Epiphany, shines upon our path. This light is what guides our feet to worship this day. So we come to this place just as we are, with our joys and our sorrows. With our faith and our doubt. With our questions and our wisdom. Claiming our place within the body of Christ. Claiming our place in the light of His love. And making room. Always making room. For others to claim their place here too. God, our Creator, You are our living light, our bright morning star of mercy, our source of life and love. It is in Your name that we gather today. No matter how far apart we are, no matter the distance between us, we know that your spirit binds us to one another. Help us build one another up. Remind us to hold each other in prayer. Empower us to be bright lights of hope in this dark and troubled world. Gift us with strength, compassion, courage, and faith, we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's sure nice to have you here today. The sun's shining. It's not quite so cold outside anymore. And I'm glad that you're here. I had a couple of friends come by and visit today and each of them kind of needed something. So I just thought I'd take a minute and check in with them if that's okay with you. We'll start with this fellow. Good morning. What is it you're needing? Oh, he needs a Band-Aid. Luckily, I brought along my trusty uh, first aid kit. You should never go too far without a first aid kit. Let's see if I have a Band-Aid in here. Ah, I do. Perfect. All right, my friend. Let's give you a Band-Aid. Now you said right up here on your head, right? There you go. There. Does that feel better? Good. All right. What about you? What do you need? Oh, he hurt his paw and he feels he needs something a bit more uh, extensive than a Band-Aid. Let's see what else I've got. Hmm. Well, I have a tensor. I usually keep this around for Grace when she falls on the ice, but we can use it for you today. Let's wrap your leg up here. There we go. How's that? Does that feel better? Okay, good. And how about you? What are you needing today? Oh, he is just feeling a little sad and wants a hug. Well, that I can most certainly do. Come here. Oh, there. That feel better? Good. I'm glad. Have you ever needed a Band-Aid or a tensor bandage or maybe even a cast? I fell down. No, I never fell down the stairs. Grace fell down the stairs. She bonked her head and needed stitches. I fell off the swing once and I needed a Band-Aid on my leg. I still have a scar there too. We're sure lucky that we have adults and friends, doctors, teachers, who can help us feel better and heal our bodies when we get hurt. That's a pretty amazing thing. Today, in our Bible story, we hear about a time where Jesus quoted some scripture from an old prophet from many, many years ago named Isaiah. And Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed and to bind up the brokenhearted. I was thinking a little bit about that, about what it meant to bind up the brokenhearted. You see, my friends over here, well, their bodies were hurt. They needed a Band-Aid and a tensor bandage. But this fellow, well, there was nothing wrong with his physical body, but his heart was sure hurting. And giving him a hug made him feel better. So sometimes we need an actual Band-Aid or an actual bandage. Sometimes. We just need a hug or a kind word, and that binds up our hearts. Some of the people were really surprised to hear Jesus saying these words, and some of them were just really grateful because Jesus was doing some amazing things. He was healing and making people feel better when their bodies were hurt, and he was also making them feel better when they felt lost or afraid or alone. And we're called to do the same thing too. So sometimes we need to look around us and see if maybe there's someone who's not feeling so happy or feeling a little lonely or sad. And we can try to do things to make them feel better. We can color them a picture, or we can sing them a song, or we can give them a, give them a hug and just let them know that we're thinking of them. And if you're feeling that way too, if your heart's feeling a little sad, then you can go to the adults in your house and your home that you trust and you can ask them to help you feel better. You can talk about it. And you know what, sometimes talking about how we're feeling, well, that really binds up our hearts as well. So I sure hope you're doing okay today. And maybe this afternoon, you can check in with some of your favorite stuffies and see how they're all feeling. And maybe you can have a little cuddle with them and feel a little better yourself too. Does that sound good? All right, it was sure good seeing you today. Oh, what's that? He wants one more hug. You got it. We'll see you next week. Okay. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 4, 
verses 14 to 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every heart be acceptable unto you, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. Amen. First days stand out. If I were to ask you about your first day of school, for example, could you tell me about it? Could you tell me who your kindergarten teacher was or who sat next to you during story time? How about that first date you had with your partner or the first day you brought your baby home? How about your first day of retirement? What was that day like? To be honest, that day is a bit more of a dream for me, but you get my point. First days stand out. I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, but I can distinctly remember the first day my grandmother moved in with us. And that was like over 30 years ago. There's just something about those firsts that cement themselves into our narrative. How about your first day of work? What was that day like? For me, it was a bright and sunny Tuesday as I drove my 1986 Cadillac to Canistino. I walked into the church office, sat down at the desk, and realized that I had absolutely no idea what I was supposed to do. So I poked around a bit, dug through cupboards and drawers, found where they kept the Christmas decorations, that sort of thing. Eventually, I decided the best thing I could do was prepare for Sunday morning. I can't for the life of me remember what I actually said that day, clearly nothing riveting, but I do remember feeling it was important to be prepared. For Jesus, his first day of work, well, that was something to write home about. All of the gospel writers tell this start part of the story, Jesus' public ministry part, by highlighting different things, of course. Mark begins with the casting out of an unclean spirit. Matthew has Jesus knocking his first public speech out of the homiletical park with the Beatitudes. John, as you'll recall, have, has him start with a miracle, water into wine. As for Luke, well, he starts this part of Jesus' story by having him go home. He goes back to Nazareth, and his first recorded ministry moment in the Gospel of Luke happens in a synagogue where he was brought up. There he is handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. It's not flashy, or fancy, or new, or shocking, at least not on the surface. He begins his ministry by simply reading scripture. Now, to be fair, this is only part one of a two-part story. The shocking bit comes next week where the drama kicks in, so make sure you tune in for that. But for today, this is how it begins. It begins with scripture. It begins by Jesus placing the Spirit of God at the center of his ministry. It begins with words of hope and promise. It's gentle and soft and lovely, pretty much exactly what we're all needing right now, I think. But a part of me can't help but wonder what the people were, who were there that day actually thought about the prophetic words of Isaiah that Jesus read to them. Like when they heard them, did they think they were nice enough words about a lovely enough future, but one that was ultimately unrealistic and unobtainable? Did they look to the future in the same way that maybe we look to it these days? Sort of with trepidation 
painted with a hint of hope, but not expect any expectation that anything's really going to change or get all that much better. Maybe that's why the other gospel writers paid more attention to all the wonders that Jesus had started to do in those early days, the healings and miracles and whatnot, where Luke merely hints at them. Maybe they thought that was a better place to start, more impressive. But I think in starting the way he did, Luke was making a pretty powerful point. Scott Hosey wrote, Jesus was not interested in parlor tricks and miracles on demand. He wasn't interested in worldly authority and being hailed as the new Caesar. He wasn't interested in making angels appear out of thin air. He was interested in the word of God, in serving God quietly, in letting God's slow kingdom coming remain a hidden phenomenon. And so for Luke, maybe it was important to start with the very word Jesus had come to proclaim a word that pointed to a future that was ready to come into being through him, a word that holds as much truth and power today as it did back then. When Isaiah spoke these words to his people, things were a mess. They felt lost and isolated and afraid of what lay ahead. And when Jesus read these words at his hometown synagogue, things were a mess. The people felt lost and isolated and afraid of what lay ahead. And when we heard them this morning, sitting at home in our pajamas, rapid antigen tests scattered all around with one eye on Russia and one on the grocery prices, well, turns out things are still kind of a mess. People feel lost and isolated and afraid of what lies ahead. And I wonder sometimes how we're supposed to cope with it, How do we cope with being stuck in the middle between living in chaos while at the same time clutching the word of hope close to our hearts? Parker J. Palmer suggests that Christianity is a spiritual path that requires us to stand in the tragic gap of living. On his website, Center for Courage and Renewal, he defines this tragic gap as the space between the reality of the world around us, poverty, greed, oppression, all that great stuff, and the promise of what we know is possible, peace, community, generosity. We know that suffering exists because we endure it, and we know what's possible because we've seen it. The reason this gap between the two, the reason that's tragic, is due to that being an eternal part of the human condition. There's simply little we can do to avoid it. As people of faith, we are called, challenged, encouraged, pushed even, to learn how to find the courage to exist in that gap. Palmer states that if we don't, we either become corrosive cynics or irrelevant idealists, both of whom are ultimately disconnected with reality. But those who know how to stand in the tragic gap, seeing both suffering and joy, seeing the challenge and the possibility, Well, they're the ones who keep working for and witnessing to the coming kingdom of God. As Jesus began his ministry on his first day of work, the plan was never for him to snap his fingers and make everything suddenly perfect. If it was, then his time in the wilderness with the tempter would have ended very differently. The plan was for him to show the embodied promise of God within the imperfection of the world he was born into. His job was to show through his ministry the light God longed for the people to see when everything was so overwhelmingly dark. He came to us that we might come to know God right in the middle of the struggle and consequently find beauty in the middle of it too. And in so doing, we make space for the kingdom of God to be ushered in, even when it feels so out of reach. Scott Hosey continues, For whatever reason, the kingdom of God comes within us long before it comes into view under the spotlights and klieg lights of the wider world. It takes faith to believe that the quiet little man who sat down in the Nazareth synagogue that day was very God of very God, light of light, and all that. It takes faith to believe that Joseph's son was the cosmic creator of all things, great and small. 
and it takes faith to believe him when he says that something as soaring as Isaiah 61 is being fulfilled somehow in that outback region of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago. But that is who we are, people of faith. Wavering faith at times, to be sure, but I think that's part of this space too. And it's why we stand here in the middle, because this is where people of faith, the people of God, have always stood. This is where Jesus stood, and it's where Jesus calls us to stand. And from here, we try to proclaim good news to a world that is inundated with the opposite. We strive to keep our eyes open to the needs of those around us and bring relief to those who are feeling stuck or lost. We do our best to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted and make space for those who are feeling oppressed and silenced. We stand here in the space between heartache and delight, between chaos and perfection, between doubt and understanding. We stand here together, trusting that it's holy ground we stand on trusting that God's promised kingdom that is both here all around us all the time and is still coming is something worth fighting for. Amen. Holy God, we give thanks that your Spirit is upon us this day, that you fill us with power and truth and hope. We know that as we lift our prayers to you, no matter where we are, you are there, listening, hearing each word, holding each feeling, understanding us perfectly, and all the things our souls have to offer. We pray for our community and all those who are feeling broken in heart, mind, and spirit, for those who are ill, bring healing. For those who are grieving, bring comfort. For those who are lost, 
bring hope. Remind us to be gentle with one another. We pray for those around the world who need your sustaining spirit to fall upon them. We pray for all those affected by the volcano eruption at Tonga. We pray for those who live in fear of war. We pray for those who endure famine and drought. Help us be agents of change in a world that needs so much healing. Help us be generous and kind and thoughtful. And for ourselves, we also pray. We lift up to you our struggles, our doubts, our weariness. We lift up to you our sorrow, our anger, our guilt. We lift up to you our longing, our searching, our desire to know you. We lift to you our joy, our gratitude, our love. We lift up to you our hearts and all that we hold within them, that you might bind them up and offer us peace. All this and so much more we offer to you, God of life and hope and courage, saying together the words you taught us and we love to hear. Calling you by whichever name feels most like home, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you as you learn to stand in the middle, this space that is both chaotic and cathartic, breathtaking and heartrending. May God bless you as you learn that this is holy ground, imperfect, but holy. And we are blessed to stand here together, together in this space where the power and strength of the Creator comes, together in this space where we glimpse the kingdom of the Holy One, together in this space where the light of Christ leads us ever onwards. And all God's people said, Amen. Ask us, Lord.